Well, hello again, my friends, and welcome once more to the Invisible College. And um, we're going to continue our investigation into the whole uh, question of the lost tribes of Israel. As you know, um, from my last lecture, if you've watched it, uh, when I went to Israel for the first time in 1972, and I was working there in Tel Aviv, I had a little job in the and the youth hostel there, um, I met an old man who was a Bible scholar and I got chatting with him and he showed me various things in the Bible and he talked to me and he, he reprimanded me for saying that Israel had returned. He said, no, Israel has not returned, only Judah has returned. And I didn't know what he meant, but he explained that there was a separate country known as Israel as well as a, a kingdom known as Judah, um, and that the Israelites of this other Israel, ten tribes, had uh, been removed and taken out from their homeland and deported by the Assyrians. Um, and he claimed that the British uh, were descended from these lost tribes. And I thought this is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, how could this possibly be true? <laughs> We're Anglo-Saxons and Celts and Scots and who knows what else. Um, uh, Welsh. Uh, we're not um, lost tribes of Israel. Come on, we're not Jews. Um, but he also explained to me that not all Israelites were Jews. Um, what we call the Jews now were the descendants um, and also converts to the Jewish faith. And originally they were from the southern kingdom of Judah, which was just two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. So he said that there were, not all Israelites were Jews. Um, the Jews were Israelites, but uh, or at least some of them. But the, he claimed that... Uh, the Israelites were lost to history and they migrated. So I decided to look into this, but I was walking home and I went past a, a place in Buckingham Gate and I saw on the, on the gate post a little plaque that said British Israel World Federation. And something in me made me think, well, I, this guy only a month or two earlier had been telling me about how the British were Israelites. Um, I'd better go in and see what they have to say to them for themselves. So I went in there and I got talking to a lady who um, was in charge of their library and their, their bookshop there. Um, and she sold me a number of uh, different leaflets and pamphlets and so on. And I took that all the way to study. And I, you know, I had a very... Um, ambivalent feeling about this. I thought this sounds to me like some kind of weird cult, uh, to be honest with you. And I thought, I don't believe this, but I'll, I'll give them a chance and I'll have a look to see what they have to say. Um, because it seemed interesting as much as anything. And I do like um, interesting ideas. I'm ready to be entertained by them, let's put it that way, without believing. So I, I thought I'll look into this. I'll give them the time of day and I'll, I'll look into this and see where it leads and if there's any kind of truth to what's going on. Now, among the leaflets that I was given was this one, which is called Lost Tribes Found in Assyrian Archives. And that's what we're going to be describe, uh, talking about today. And at the same time, these Assyrian archives, I later, I came by these books, um, by Luckenbill, I think, yes, and they're called Ancient Records of Assyria and Babylon, and they're in two volumes, you can see them here. So I have actually got the reference books that this gentleman, Mr. Filmer, refers to in his pamphlet. So in this lecture, I'm going to show you how he was accurate in what he was saying about these records. He, he was not lying. 
he was telling the truth that these uh, the data exists in these books if you have take the trouble to look for them and most people would never have heard of these but what they are is they are translations of the texts um, on many different stone slabs um, they, they also had um, libraries of uh, uh, clay tablets that they ins inscribed things all done in what's called cuneiform cuneiform uh, was the script that they used in Mesopotamia and in other places around there, in, into Persia and parts of Turkey. They used a cuneiform script. It was very widely used in the Middle East um, in ancient times. And we're talking about uh, times of Babylon and Assyria and Persia. So this is our base data. And I'm someone who does believe that if you're going to make um, uh, a claim uh, as much as possible, you should go to um, primary sources. And although Mr. Filmer's you know, leaflets are great, he, he did a lot of work on this, um, that's not a primary source. The uh, Luck and Build translations, I don't read cuneiform, so I have to take the word... Um, for it, that the scholars of uh, Assyriology knew what they were doing when they were translating these various texts. But I have at least got the English translations of them and can look it up. And I've done that. And that's what we're going to be doing in here now. Now then, uh, where's this? Now then, um, I want to, before I go into this, I, I think I should say a few words about the history of ancient Israel and the Israelites, because many people haven't read the Bible, they maybe don't have any contact with the, the church. When I was brought up, you know, I was a boy in the 50s, a teenager in the 60s, um, and I went to Catholic schools, and we were taught um, you know, we, we read the Bible, and especially the New Testament, obviously, but I read right through the Bible, and um, so I was familiar with the basic history, or some of it, at least. Uh, and I, I know that not everybody's had that kind of background now, so I'll, I'll say a few words here. Um, you're probably aware that there was a man called Abraham who... Uh, He's a you know, descendant of Noah, and he's told by God that he should move, he should take his uh, you know, uh, family and they should go to the promised land. And he has a son, he has two sons actually, there's one called Ishmael, who is born of an Egyptian bondwoman, that means she was a, a, a household slave, you would say, um, and... Ishmael becomes the patriarch of the Arabs, uh, if you go into the story. But the other son, Isaac, is born to his wife when she's a very old woman. Um, he's over 80 at the time that uh, Isaac's born. I, I, I think his wife is about the same, maybe a little younger. So... She's not expecting to have any children by that time. Why would she? And they hadn't had any children up to that, up till then. But then Isaac, Isaac comes along. Um, and he's the patriarch of, you would call them the Isaacites or the Isaacs, uh, the, the Ben Isaacs, the sons of Isaac. And he has two sons. One's called Edom or Esau and the other's called Jacob. And Jacob's the primary one that interests us. He has visions, he sees angels going, he has dreams, he sees angels going up and down a ladder. Um, he, he also has promises that he's going to have a, uh, you know, inheritance in the promised land and he's going to have, his sons are going to do very well. And he has 12 sons. And from these sons are born the 12 tribes of Israel. And they move to Egypt 
in the time of famine, one of the sons, Joseph, who had been sold as a slave to the Egyptians, he's risen up the ranks and he's become a very important man in Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh himself. Uh, he's able to interpret dreams, he's pretty clairvoyant, and he he does well by his family. He, he welcomes them and they settle there in Egypt, but later things go bad, later generations, the Egyptians start oppressing them and they become slaves. So then they're led out of Egypt. You know this, you've probably seen the Charlton Heston film, you know, the Ten Commandments, and Moses, Charlton Heston, leads them out of, the, out of Egypt and the Egyptians go chasing after them and they cross the Red Sea, the, the sea parts and they cross and they, they're able to escape and the sea closes over the Egyptians and they get drowned. You've probably heard of that. And they move back into what's now Israel and they gradually conquer large parts of it. Not all of it actually, but they conquer large parts of it and they establish a kingdom there, the kingdom of Israel. And at first, uh, it's just that they, they're ruled over by what are called judges. You read the earlier parts of the Bible, it talks about these judges, people like Samson, you know, the one who was really, really strong, and then he had his hair cut, and he, he lost all his strength because he had his hair cut. Uh, you have these kind of stories, um, about the judges but then it moves on and they get kings the first one King Saul turns out to be a bad sort and he's replaced by David and this is the big man this is the big high point in the Old Testament the kingdom of David and he establishes the capital at Jerusalem and his son Solomon builds the temple the Temple of Solomon, where the Ark of the Covenant, which they brought with them after their trip, you know, the Exodus, it hadn't had a proper shelter up till that point. He builds the temple, which is basically a place to keep the Ark. And all the sacrificing and religious stuff is done outside, actually, of the main building. It's done in the big courtyard. Um, <coughs> and that becomes the you know, familiar story, we're beginning to understand this um, from what we see in, you know, in, in Israel today. If you go and visit there, you can see the Temple Mount and so on. Um, anyway, after Solomon's death, Solomon was a bit of a bad boy. Um, he had lo loads of wives, I think 800 concubines and 200 wives or something ridiculous. Um, and a lot of these these concubines and wives were throwing women, and they introduced their throwing gods into Israel, and this was very bad. And he was also very um, avaricious. He taxed the people really hard. He uh, he was immensely rich, and it said his income was uh, just a part of it was six hundred and sixty six talents of gold per year. So you can imagine, that's an awful lot of money. Um, a talent was a sort of big slab of gold, you know, and um, 666 of those each year, you know, that's a hefty whack. And the people, after he died, um, they rebelled against his son. He had a son called Rehoboam. Uh, I think I've got that right. And the ten tribes rebelled. Two tribes remained loyal to Rehoboam, and that was the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And they formed a kingdom called Judah, and the Jews are descended from them. But the other ten tribes, uh, they occupied the northern part of Israel and uh, Gilead, which was part of what, what I think is now um, uh, Jordan, uh, you know, and other bits over the, over, on the east side of the Jordan River. Um, and parts of what's now Lebanon was also part of the territory uh, con controlled or owned by 
these other tribes. And they formed a kingdom of their own, um, which was ruled over by a king called Jeroboam. Uh, it's easy to get those two mixed up. And they separated from the southern kingdom. They had their own kingdom and they had their own line of kings. So today we're going to talk about this northern kingdom <coughs> principally. We will mention the southern kingdom as well. But um, these are what are called later on the lost tribes of Israel. And that's what this gentleman had been talking to me about. Now, um, I also want to uh, tell you a little bit about the, uh, the environment in which they lived. Uh, you've probably heard of Babylon, and later on the Babylonians invade uh, the southern kingdom and they carry the, the Jews away to Babylon, They're weeping and wailing behind the beside the rivers of Babylon. And later on, they're released from there. They go back and rebuild their temple. That's a separate story. Before then, there was a very powerful kingdom called Assyria. Now, the Assyrians, um, at the height of their empire, the Assyrian empire included all of Mesopotamia. That Mesopotamia means between the two rivers, and that's the Bab Babylon you know, that, that whole area of, of Iraq, basically, uh, and also the northern part of Iraq, where um, what we would now call Kurdistan, and the eastern, much of the eastern part of Turkey, the, the main body of Turkey, was, was uh, included in their empire, a place called Aratu, um, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Palestine, or Israel, if you like to call it that, um, and down into Egypt. They, they conquered Egypt. So they had this huge empire, the biggest that had been seen in the Middle East up to that point. And the Assyrians were absolutely ruthless. They would just go out conquering their neighbours, the, the smaller kingdoms around them, and they would exact heavy tributes on them. So you got conquered. If you stood up against them, uh, if your city resisted, they would lay siege to it. And once they had they'd destroyed, you know, broken in, they'd destroy the city, they'd completely loot it, they'd rape the women, and they'd steal all their goods and take the people hostage into captivity elsewhere. And this is what they did all over the place. And people are absolutely terrified of the Assyrians. Uh, rightly so, because they were, you know, absolutely ruthless and, and at the top of their game, they were unbeatable. And to discourage rebellions, as I say, they deported people and they moved them from one place to another. They might move them from Palestine, say, uh, you know, the, the Israel area, uh, up to the Caspian Sea. And... Um, the people who are deported, they have no links with us, the place they've been taken to. They're disorientated. They've got to find their feet. They can, you know, it's difficult. And they've they, they moved the people who had lived in the other place into where they were. And they're equally disorientated and, and don't know what's going on and, and so on. And they, by doing this, they made it easier for them to control their subject nations who they taxed very heavily still. So you can understand that um, life in those days, at the time of the Assyrian Empire, was not easy. Not easy at all. And the, the Bible talks a lot about this. And you get this story, if you want to read about it, read the second book of Kings. I would recommend you maybe read the first book of Kings first. But that's mainly about David and Solomon. Um, you come into the second book of Kings and it goes into all of this, the two kingdoms, Israel and Judah, and talking about what was happening with them and various prophets. Uh, interesting, it's, it's actually a good read. It's not, it's not boring at all. Uh, it's a ripping yarn, actually. You, know, you might find that interesting. Anyway, the Bible tells us 
that following the death of King Solomon in 931 BC, so we're talking about the 10th century BC, there was a revolution in Israel against the house of David. Well, I mentioned that to you just now. Ten of the twelve tribes separated to form their own kingdom. They retained the name of Israel, choosing a king of their own called Jeroboam. The two remaining tribes, Judah and Benjamin, plus most of the Levitical priesthood, and the Levites remained with the two other tribes, Judah and Benjamin, to form the southern kingdom. So, a succession of kings would rule over ten tribe Israel for some 130 years. So it's a fair length, but not that long. From the point of view of the Bible, all of them were, to a greater or lesser extent, bad kings. Yeah, Jeroboam, or Jeroboam himself instituted worship of golden calves in high places. So we're back to, you know, in the book of Exodus, it talks about the, the golden calf, and Moses is absolutely furious when he sees them worshipping a golden calf. He throws down the Ten Commandments and... Uh, he punishes them for doing that. Well, this guy started it again, this golden calf worship, um, imported from neighbouring peoples, and he thinks that that's a good thing to do. Uh, and that's going to really antagonise God as they they progress. So that that was uh, Yoruboam. Um so he was the first of ten kings of ten tribes northern Israel, going down to one called Jehu, or Jehu. We'll come to him, him in a minute. Um, so he had Jeroboam, who was from 931 to 910, Nadab from 910 to 909, Elah from, uh, sorry, Baasha from 909 to 886, Elah from 886 to 885, that was a short time. Zimri, who was also in 885. Um, Omri, and now this is a very important one, Omri. We're going to hear a lot about him. And he was from 885 to 874. And he founded the city of Samaria as a new capital. So um, he, that Samaria became also one of the names but that this kingdom was known by. It's called Israel, it's called Samaria, and it also takes the name of uh, Omri, uh, as we'll discover. Uh, Omri had a son called Ahab, not Ahab with the white whale, <laughs> this is the first Ahab, and he was married to a woman called Jezebel, who was a really wicked witch. <laughs> And she was, this was at the time of Elijah the prophet. Now we're going to hear a lot about Ahab as well. Very bad guys, uh, bad couple, um, caused a lot of trouble in Israel. After them called one, came one called Ahaziah, and then one called Joram, or Joram, and Finally, we come down to Jehu, and we're going to meet Jehu shortly. He's a very important figure in this uh, in this story. That's the first ten kings of northern Israel. As time went on, so the Israelites adopted more and more of the religions of the nations they had supplanted. They took up Baal worship, or if you're American, you say Baal. <laughs> And we would we would call him Baal, B W A L in Britain, um, Baal worship and other cults that even involve sacrificing their own children. I mean, this is shocking stuff. Um, much of this was introduced by a king called Ahab and his wife Jezebel, where we just met them, and she was not even an Israelite but a Phoenician. So she came from the northern bit up there. She was a Phoenician. And she instituted uh, in, uh, that the uh, sorry, she insisted that the national religion should be Baal worship, and ordered that to be murdered most of the prophets of Israel. So you have a huge uh, 
transformation caused by this wicked woman who supplanted the ancient religion, introducing this Baal worship and these other you know, gods of the people round about uh, into Israel itself and her, her weak husband Ahab allowed this and he was complicit. Um, we have the story of Elijah, the chief prophet of the time. He prophesied against them. He actually was their number one enemy, Elijah. Elijah. And you maybe heard, maybe even read Eric von Daniken talking about chariots of the gods. He's the one that's whipped up in the chariot of fire, going to heaven. He, he doesn't die. He's taken body and everything to heaven. Um, was that a spaceship? I don't know. <laughs> but we're talking about um, something pretty amazing. And he had amazing powers, Elijah, or Eliah. Um, and he was able to bring fire down from heaven and this sort of thing. So he, he was a pretty amazing person. Anyway, he's the chief prophet of the times. And he prophesies that dogs would lick up Ahab's blood and that they would, dogs would consume her body. And this actually came to pass, as we'll see. Now, Ahab's father, as I was saying earlier, was King Omri, who ruled from 885 to 874. And he founded the city of Samaria, which became the capital of Israel. Consequently, the Israelites came to be called Samaritans. And Omri himself, as the founder of Samaria, was subsequently looked upon as the father of the nation. So you have to understand that the Assyrians and other people like that, they didn't know anything about Israel or Jacob or Abraham. They didn't care. You know, as far as they were concerned, this guy who founded Samaria, and Samaria is a very important city, which the Assyrians themselves sieged for three years so they knew all about Samaria um, and they knew that Omri had found it so they knew the people as the sons of Omri uh, so th this is important and we'll come to that shortly so Israel and Judah were just two of a number of small tribal kingdoms that then existed in the Levant. And the Levant is this coastal region um, south of Syria, uh, uh, going to Egypt. We call it the Levant. It includes Lebanon and uh, Israel and Gaza and all of that, that whole area there. Others were Moab, Edom, Aram, Philistia, Phoenicia and Syria. There were frequent wars between these kingdoms, with Israel and Judah sometimes on the same side and sometimes against one another. Eliah received prophecies against Ahab that his entire house, all the males, will be wiped out. So <laughs> you can imagine how Ahab felt about that prophecy. And Eliah was also told to anoint Jehu, the son of Nimri, to become king of Israel. And he would be the one to execute God's command that the house of Abraham, Ahab be annihilated. So this guy Jehu, or Yehu, he's another you know, very important figure in this northern Israel kingdom, which was going to last for 130 years, not that long. And Yehu was captain of the guards. So this is a good place to be if you have ideas about taking over kingship. He was captain of the guards and he was indeed anointed on the orders of Elias' successor, Elisha, who sent a son to do the anointing. And this is in the second book of Kings, chapter 9. And the story goes like this. Uh, Elisha... Um, uh, says to his son, he says, right, you must go secretly to the tent of Yehu and very quickly, when, before they know what's going on, 
you have to pour oil over his head and anoint him as the king of Israel and then run away as fast as you can. <laughs> so the Psalms are very brave, I have to say. He, he finds an excuse to go and see the captain of the guard in his tent and quickly produces a bottle of anointing oil and pours it over his head and anoints him as king of Israel and then he, he runs off. So fortunately, the the troops were quite happy with this. You know, his his men, he's got a legion or more people behind him to, you know, he's the captain of this prime regiment. Um, he was acclaimed by his troops and he went on and killed the entire male line of Ahab and Jezebel. Um, and he went to Samaria and Jezebel was upstairs and a couple of eunuchs up there attending her and, and they looked out of the window and he said, are you with me? And I said, yes. <laughs> he said, well, throw her out. <laughs> so they throw Jezebel out of the window and she just lands in the street, bang. And that's Jezebel done with. And he goes inside, right, now we're going to celebrate. So they, they have a nice you know, celebration banquet or whatever. She's still left outside uh, in the street. And when they finish their eating and their feasting, he says, oh, well, we better go and bury Jezebel. She is a queen after all. So he goes outside, and lo and behold, um, there's nothing left of her except the palms of her hands and her feet and her skull. The dogs have eaten all the rest. They must have been very hungry dogs. Um, so that was the end of Jezebel, um, this wicked witch. So Jehu was acclaimed by his troops. Um, and you find all, all this in Second Book of Kings, chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. And I should say also that Ahab, I think his body fell into some water and the dogs lapped up that water, a puddle or something. So they did drink his blood, uh, as has been prophesied also by Elijah. So that was the end of the um, Ahab dynasty. And we now have the Yahu dynasty. But we're not sure, it doesn't say in the Bible, but it seems likely that Yahu um, was actually descended from Omri. As Ahab was descended from Omri, but that branch has been cut off and all of the, the males have been slain. Um, and they're going, the, the, they had married into the, the line of Judah, and they are also disposed of as well. So the entire line of Ahab is completely removed. Um, we're now going to have the, the lineage of Yahu. So I just wanted you to see here a map of the old Assyrian Empire before the events we're, we're going to describe take place. And you can see that even then it was quite large, this uh, uh, brownish coloured area, that, which included um, uh, all of the uh, northern part of um, Mesopotamia. Uh, at that time, Babylon was not included in it, but they had bits and pieces going into Turkey and across into eastern part of Syria up to the Euphrates River and going, uh, sorry, west to the Euphrates River, the, the eastern side of it, um, and going across to parts of Media and into what would now be um, part of Persia or part of Iran. So it was quite large even then in the Old Kingdom but it's going to get much larger under the Assyrian New Kingdom, which we're going to be discussing now. So over the course of the next 150 years, it would grow to include most of what is now eastern Turkey, part of Iran, a bigger part than before, the Levant, Jordan, and even Egypt. So it goes right down into Egypt, uh, you know, taking over all of that area that you can see in the light green as well as the darker green. Now, 
I'll just quickly run through a list of the kings of Assyria. We'll be meeting them individually as we go along, um, especially those who are important to us. But we had Tinglath Pileser III, and then we had, he was from 744 to 727. We had Shalmaneser V from 726 to 722. We had Sargon II, 721 to 705. Sennacherib, 704 to 681. Um, and then Esarhaddon from 680 to 669. And then we have uh, uh, some later ones, but they won't interest us so much. So th that's what we're dealing with, the, particularly Tiglath Pileser the third, Shalmaneser the fifth, Sargon the second, and Sennacherib. Now, as I said, the Assyrian army was brutal in the extreme. Any city that resisted would be sieged, sacked, and the population deported. Those who didn't resist would still have to pay heavy taxes each year. So their kingdoms were just satrapies. They were, they were conquered nations. Uh, they'd lost their independence. They're satellite states. And the first of these Assyrian kings to turn his attention west was Shalmaneser III, who ruled from 858 to 824 BC. And he crossed the Euphrates ten times. It talks about all that actually within the, uh, the, uh, the book here, Shalmaneser III, and it, it talks a lot about his crossing the Euphrates. And he, I'll, I'll see if I can find a little bit to read out to you, because it gives you a, a good flavour. Completely devastating. These, it's a bit like Russia going into Ukraine, you know. Uh, he goes into these places, he destroys the cities, deports the people, uh, and uh, you know, imposes heavy taxes on whatever's left. Um, I burned with fire, Kaki, king of Hubushkia, before the terror of my mighty arms, he became afraid, and he made the mountain his stronghold. A fierce battle I waged in the midst of the mountain. What was left of their possessions I brought down out of the mountain. From Hubushkia I departed to the sea of Ner, Neri. I advanced, I washed my weapons in the sea, and offered sacrifices to the gods. On my return from the sea I received the tribute of Azu the Gilzanite. To my city Ashur I brought it. So this is the kind of thing, this guy was absolutely ruthless, really unpleasant character. <laughs> who was um, just bursting into other people's countries and, and uh, taking whatever he wants and massacring them and, and destroying their cities. Um, so he crossed the Euphrates ten times to gradually conquer the little tribal states of the Levant. In vain they formed an alliance led by Syria to defend against the Assyrians. The, Syria and the Assyrians are not the same thing. Assyria, with an A in the front, is the sort of eastern area. More, the core part is what we would now call Kurdistan. Um, the, the western part, uh, you know, go west from that, you have Syria proper, what we would call Syria today. So Syria, with its capital of Damascus, went into an alliance with Israel and, and Judah and a, a couple of other little states like Edom, Moab, to try to defend against this tyrant who was coming in their direction, but it didn't, didn't help them. In vain they formed an alliance led by Syria to defend against the Assyrians. It was to no avail. Shalmanesha plundered Damascus and went all the way to the Mediterranean coast. He, he talks thrillingly about how he got to the coast of this big sea and he was the first, first Assyrian to do this. Uh, what a great guy he is. So, um, now we see in the British Museum an obelisk, uh, it's called the Black Obelisk, 
and it has various, um, it's, it's Assyrian and it has inscriptions on it and it has little uh, uh, scenarios um, of uh, the great things that this king has done. Depicted in one of these panels is Jehu, which I told you about before Yehu, prostrates himself before the Assyrians. So there he is, he's, he, <laughs> he's trying to keep his throne and he knows that uh, he's got to be a good boy, otherwise uh, they're going to do to him what they did to Damascus and the king of Assyria. And this would have happened in 827 to 8, uh, 828 to 827 BC on our calendar. Now we can read in volume 1 of the Assyrian texts on page 211, text 590, and this is Shalmaneser III's boast. So this is written on that black obelisk, he says here, tribute from Yawa, which is Jehu, son of Omri, and he says, calls that Mahumri in Assyrian. Um, silver, gold, a golden bowl, a golden beaker, gold goblets, pitchers of gold. I'm seeing a pattern here. This guy likes gold. But he has lead as well. Staves for the hand of the king. Javelins are received from him. So he's getting some weapons. He's getting some lead. Very useful if you're going to... Put in some plumbing, I suppose, or uh, maybe you're going to use it for some other purpose. Uh, but mostly he's after the gold. Um, note that in Assyrian, Omri, founder of Samaria, is called Humri, with an H on the front. And this H would have been a hard guttural sound, similar to KH. So it would be somewhere like Humri, humri, uh, in the back of the throat, humri, humri. <laughs> As we shall see, this seems to be the origin of the names Cumri or Cumri, spelt with a U, and also Gimri in Babylonian inscriptions as the accepted name for the people descended from the northern kingdom of Israel. To the Assyrians, they were all sons of Omri, Ma Omri. Jehu is a rather important king of Israel. On God's orders, he assassinates Yoram. Yeah, I didn't mention that. His mother, Jezebel, is thrown from the window and her body, as prophesied, eaten by dogs. He goes out on to order the slaughter of all the house of Ahab and Jezebel, including all 70 sons. So it wasn't just a couple of sons, there's 70 of them. As if that were not enough, Jehu slaughters all the followers of Baal. The temple of Baal is destroyed and its site turned into a latrine. So God is going to say, well done, well done, Jehu. You got rid of that Baal worship that I don't like and you turn their temple or what's left of it into a latrine. All this is approved of in the Bible, but Yehu does nothing about the worship of golden calves on the high places of Bethel and Dan. So, black mark there. Should have got rid of the golden calves as well, but at least you got rid of the Baal worship. And this leads to Israel losing a war with Syria and hence forfeiting Gilead, its territories east of the Jordan River. These were the tribal lands of the Gadites, Reubenites, and half of the Manasseites. And you see that in 2 Kings uh, chapter 10, verses 32 to 33. So the tribute paid by Yehu to Assyria would have been to avert a full-scale invasion of Israel. So the subsequent kings of Israel after Yehu are Jehoahaz, 814 to 798, Jehoash, 798 to 782, Jeroboam II, 782 to 753, Zechariah, 753 to 752, Shalom, 752, Menachem, 752 to 742, it gets a bit longer, 10 years, then 
Bekahiah 742 to 740. Then we get Pekah 740 to 730. And during his reign, we get the first abduction of Assyria, Israelites to Assyria by Tiglath, Tiglath Pileser III. And we get Hoshea 732 to 723. We get the main abduction of Israelites to Assyria by Shalmaneser V. So, and these are the later kings of Assyria, and I'll, I'll just talk about a couple of them. So, so we got Tiglath Pileser the third. We, then we get Shalmaneser the fifth. He carries out a major deportation. Sargon the second, and then Sennacherib. And Sennacherib deports uh, from Judah, and then we get other ones coming after that. So Tiglath Pileser the third is the pull in the Bible. The Bible talks about pull. So King Menachem like Yehu, sought to buy off the Assyrians. So he's, I'm not sure if he's the son of Yehu or, um, you know, I think he is. Uh, anyway, he's the successor to Yehu. So King Menachem, uh, he, he tries to do what his dad has done and buy them off. Pul, Tiglath-Pileser III, the king of Assyria, came against the land of Israel and Menachem gave Pul a thousand talents of silver that he might help him confirm his hold on royal power. So the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay there in the land. So this must have been at the beginning of the reign of Tiglath-Pileser, perhaps 743 BC. It only bought time. The Bible tells us that the tribe of Naphtali, right, that's right up in the north there, uh, in, I think that would be into Lebanon. Well, it goes up to Dan. Dan's in Israel, but it goes beyond Dan, uh, up into the southern part of Lebanon there. So it says here, In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Leon, Abel, Beth, Machkar, Janosh, Kadesh, Hazor, Gilead, and Galilee all the land of Naphtali, and he carried the peoples captive to Assyria. So, 2 Kings 15 to 29. Bad luck on Naphtali. Anyway, this deportation is confirmed in a fragment of the annals of King Tiglath-Pileser from Nimrod Palace. So, it writes here, it's a bit broken up, the text. Some of these texts are bits are missing, you know, the lacunae in the text, but we get the gist of it. The cities of, of something nite, Galaza Abilaka, which is on the border of Bit Khomriya, the house of Omri, Israel, the wide land of Naphtali in its entirety, I bought within the borders of Assyria. So he grabbing some bits on the edge of, of uh, Bit Khomri, or the house of Omri, um, but he's also grabbing uh, the, the land of Naphtali, uh, which is up there. In uh, it, This will be uh, part where I, I worked on a kibbutz up there uh, in the Hula Valley. And that's very fertile land there. So you can see why he was after that area, just the other side of the Golan Heights. He, he wants that bit, probably took the heights as well. The Bible tells us of a further deportation of tribes on the east bank of the Jordan. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Paul. This, this I think, takes place uh, at the time when he was sacking Damascus. So the God of Israel uh, stirred up the spirit of Paul, king of Assyria, the spirit of Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and he took them into exile, namely the Rehu Reubenites, the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and brought them to Hala, Habor, Hara and the river Gozan to this day. So those are the ones who are east of the Jordan and they get carried off by Tiglath Pileser. Well, I think we talked about that a bit earlier. Um, but there you can see their lands quite clearly. 
The conquest of the other tribes by Tiglath Pileser is confirmed in a further annal. The land of Bit Qumriya, Israel, all of its peoples, together with their goods, I carried off to Assyria. This must be these, these bits to the east of Jordan, because it doesn't take all the rest. Pakaha, their king, they deposed, and I placed Osi, Hoshia, over them as king. Ten talents of gold. <laughs> He's getting a bit more gold for this. X talents of silver. Well, we don't know how many of silver. As their tribute, I received from them. And to Assyria, I carried them. So he's taking all the, way out, all the other lot. It would seem that he only deported the tribes east of the Jordan, taking tribute and leaving the rest with their new king, Hoshia, who struck down his predecessor, Pekka, in 730 BC. This is a recurring feature in these northern tribes that they keep, you know, one king or one guy kills off the previous king and takes over. A lot of usurping of the throne going on here. Um, it wasn't like that so much in Judah, the southern kingdom. If evidently Tiglath Pileser settled these tributes, tribes on the other side of the river Euphrates. You can see here um, in Assyria. Uh, this would have been in 730 BC after he had made terms with Hoshea and no doubt received tribute instead of deporting the rest of Israel at that time. So He's putting them in, you can see Haran and Gozam marked there. Uh, this is all in the Habor River as a tributary uh, going up here. You can see it going up towards Gozam. <coughs> That's tributary of the Euphrates. <coughs> so he's, he's taking his stuff and he's gone back home. Now then, in 726 BC, Tiglath-Pileser III was succeeded by his son, Shalmaneser. <clears throat> he carried off the first Israelites in 732 at the time he invaded and conquered Syria. So at that time, the tribes of Gad, Reuben and part of Manasseh were in the Syrian territories. So there's a little bit of confusion here. What seems to have happened is Tiglath-Pileser came in, he did the conquering, but he died while he was there. So it was his son, uh, Shalmaneser, who actually did the deporting. So although the earlier inscriptions are, you know, saying great things about Tiglath, Belize, he did this, that, and the other, um, yes, he did, but the actual tribute and the, the uh, deporting was done by his son, um, Shalmaneser, who had actually had a very short reign, uh, as we shall see. There's not many inscriptions of his, not many um, plaques of his doings and so on have survived to our day because he wasn't on the throne all that long. So initially, Hoshia paid the annual tribute of a vassal, of a vassal to Shalmaneser, but then he tried to break free from Assyria so he must have thought that we got the new king, you know, Shalmaneser. He's not his dad. He's not like Tiglath Pileser. Uh, he's he's probably going to be weak, and he doesn't. He, he's a bit shaky on the throne. He's only just got on there. Now's our time. We need to break three free. And he made an alliance with Saul, the king of Egypt. This is all in the Bible. Uh, this was a fatal mistake. The Bible tells us. Against him came Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, and Hoshea became his vassal and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to Saul, king of Egypt, and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria. So he had paid the first batch of tribute. Now he's thinking, well, I'm running out of gold and, you know, it's time to break free, and this might be our chance. The Ethiopians have conquered Egypt. They seem stronger than the previous Egyptians. We'll make an alliance with them and take our chances. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria 
and for three years he besieged it. So he, he's sieging Samaria, the city of Samaria, for three years. Shalmaneser V only ruled for five years, and very few texts have been found dating from his reign. The siege of Samaria took three years, and so it's possible, it's possible, it is possibly the only military campaign he fought. If so, then the mutilated text found on a damaged cylinder, British Museum 38345, must refer to this campaign. It testifies to the treachery of a king whose god did not help him to raise the yoke of Assyria. They were all carried off to Assyria. So this is a major deportation. Shalmaneser died in 722 BC and was succeeded by Sargon II, who was probably his brother. It is he who actually carried out the deportations, although this was probably the plan of Shalmaneser anyway. The Bible tells us, in the ninth year of Hoshir, the king of Assyria, i.e. Sargon, captured Samaria and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the harbour, the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. So he's put them in the same places uh, and also in the cities of the Medes. And that's Second Kings chapter 17 verse 6. Sargon boasts of his deportations on the walls of his palace at Khorsabad. At the beginning of my rule, in the first year of my reign, Samarini, the people of Samaria, of Samash, that's the sun god of the Assyrians, who causes me to attain victory. So he's saying, sun god Samash is on my side. Um, 27,290 people who lived therein, so this is just from Samaria itself, I carried away. 50 chariots for my royal equipment I selected from among them. The city, that's presumably Samaria, I rebuilt. I made it greater than it was before. People of the lands, presumably media, my hand had conquered. The, the, the Bible says that's the Medes he puts there. I settled therein. My official I placed over them as governor. Tribute tax I imposed on them as upon the Assyrians. So he's treating this now as his own land. He's conquered it. He's deported the people. Uh, he's put other people in there. He's set a governor over it. And that's now part of Assyria. They're going to pay their tax like everybody else in Assyria. After Sargon came his son Sennacherib, or Sennacherib, who ruled the Assyrian Empire from 705 to 681 BC. The kingdom of Judah, south from Israel, or Samaria, had been allied to Assyria. Again, they're turning to uh, Egypt for help, as they had done, uh, the northern kingdom had done at the time of Paul. Now they're, they're again, the southern kingdom, turning to Egypt. And the Bible warns them, don't do this. You know, I think it's Jeremiah said, oh, don't do that. Bad news. But he does it. Um, and this prompted Sennacherib to plunder nearly all of Judah and to lay siege to Jerusalem. The Bible tells us how an angel struck down the Assyrian army, which was forced to give up the siege. The Syrian archives tell a rather different story. They say, As for Hezekiah, the Jew who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong walled cities, as well as the small cities in their neighbourhood, which were without number, I besieged and took these cities. So Sennacherib has plundered all of Judah, the southern kingdom, except Jerusalem. 200,000 and 150 people, great and small, male and female, horses, mules, asses, camels, cattle and sheep, without number, I brought away from them and counted as spoil. So he's pulled all these people out, you know, 200, over 200,000 of them, and deported them. And they're going to be 
put with the other lot. Himself, that this is talking about Hezekiah, like a caged bird I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. Earthworks I threw up against him, the cities of his which I had despoiled, I cut off from his land, and thus I diminished his land. I added to the former tribute, and laid up, laid up him as their yearly payment, a tax in the form of gifts from my majesty. So he's, he's taken all his other land, he's given it to other kingdoms in the area who are considered loyal to him, and he's delivered the tax. So this is very important because what this is telling us is actually we talk about the lost ten tribes, but actually most of the other two tribes were deported as well. The only ones who survived as separate were the people who were in Jerusalem. Now that might have included people who come from outside Jerusalem to escape, um, but they they did carry on and they would be the ones who would be carried off to Babylon in later generations and return from Babylon to rebuild the temple. And the Jews we know today are descended from them, but also from converts to their religion. So when we talk about the lost tribes of Israel, it does actually include a large number of the Jews as well as those 10 tribes of the north. And that will be important for our consideration in later lectures. As for Hezekiah, the terrifying splendour of my majesty, this is an Sennacherib boasting again, overcame him. In addition to 30 talents of gold and 800 talents of silver, there were gems, antimony, jewels, large sandu stones, I don't know what sandu is, I, I guess the translator doesn't want, know what the sandu is, couches of ivory, house chairs of ivory, elephant's hide, ivory, maple, boxwood, all kinds of valuable treasures, as well as his daughters, his harem, his male and female musicians, which he had them bring after me, to Nineveh, my royal city. To pay tribute to and accept servitude, he dispatched his messengers. We aren't told the exact location of where these exiles were taken, but it seems likely that they too went to Media. So all this, all this ivory, ivory furniture, ivory this, ivory that, elephant size, that probably all dates back to the time of King David or Solomon, you know. Um, when you had the Queen of Sheba coming to visit to Solomon and uh, the, Israel was a powerful nation and they controlled the Red Sea. They were able to send ships down to uh, collect things like ivory. So uh, all this booty he's taken back, so, you know, it's precious stuff that can't be replaced and that's all been dragged off back to Assyria. So I hope that hasn't been too uh, complicated for you, but basically what we're dealing with is the people are shipped out from that land, particularly of northern Israel, but also a large part of Judah as well, and they've moved into Assyria and places east of there in Media, and it's from there that they're going to migrate. And I think people don't, there's no dispute over that. The question is, which way did they go? So thank you very much for your time. And uh, we'll go on, go on with this in future lectures. Thank you again. <laughs>